listening to New Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ. And Randy. Donald Trump's Clinton. The U.S. news media is corrupt. The Great Fall of China and special guest Jeremy Kaufman joins us in studio. All this and more on episode 181 here on November 9th, 2016. Randy? In the traditional markets, we've got gold at $1,278, silver at $18.42. We've got oil at $45.37 a barrel. The Dow Jones is trading at 18,589 points. The 30-year U.S. Treasury bond is yielding 2.81%. The euro is at $1.09. The Chinese yuan is at about 15 cents. And the British pound is trading at one dollar and twenty-four cents. In the crypto markets, Bitcoin is trading at seven twenty-two. Litecoin is trading at three eighty-one. Dash is trading at nine seventy-five. Ethereum is trading at ten seventy-two. Monero is trading at five eighty-seven. Steam is trading at about fourteen cents. Scenarios Amp are trading at a uh, little more than ten and a half cents. Augur's Rep is trading at four forty-six. And one Doge equals one Doge. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. If you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Attic, and more. And actually, we just added a YouTube channel this week. Uh, We haven't added video quite yet. But if you are on YouTube, you can find our audio feed along with uh, some beautiful moving graphics that JJ made. That's right. They're really fancy. Another way to find our stuff on all the channels. Little fireworks of uh, cryptocurrency uh, shapes. So it's pretty fun. Anyway, Dr. Tapp is recovering from the Election Day madness. He will be back in the studio soon. Now, I'd like to take a moment and introduce our special guest. Jeremy Kaufman is the founder and CEO of Library. Library is a blockchain-based content distribution platform. This is his second time on Neocash Radio. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Excellent. And uh, I have to start by making just like a super minor correction, which is, uh, I'm sure, a great way to make friends. Nice. Uh, Library is a a protocol, uh, not a platform. So Library is actually an open standard that anyone can use. And uh, one of the the great things about it is that it's not something that we uh, entirely control. Excellent. Well, thanks for clarifying that, Jeremy. And um, last time we were on the show, we we mentioned uh, we were talking about Library. And since then, Full disclosure, Fifth Quill Studios, which is owned by Randy and myself, will be working with the library to provide video content for the company and product. We'll be happy to share these videos with you as they're published. We are not advising you to buy or sell library credits. Of course, we're not advising you to buy or sell anything on this show. That's the nature of Neocash Radio. We do not speculate. We do not talk about that hype and and stuff. We encourage you to do your own independent research and check things out and uh, definitely look into security uh, security as well as investment and, you know, all those things you want to look into yourself and make your own informed decisions about. And we're just helping to get information to you that might not be finding its way to you by traditional media channels. And by the way, if you're not holding the private keys, you probably don't own the coin. So keep that in mind. Uh, starting out, big news, of course, is Donald Trump, president-elect, and Holy crap. shocked the world. Now, if you've listened to Neocash Radio, we have been talking about how Hillary is the heir apparent. I mean, that's that's been the thing. And, and you know, if you watch any sort of media out there, that's what you're being told, Fed. Well, 80% on the markets, though, too. I mean, there were people who had, they had their money in this saying that it was Hillary. It right? wasn't just the right media. Yeah, right up until the day of the election. Then it swapped. Then it was, what, 79% Donald Trump. It, it, you know, Trump was actually down to 12% in the markets at one point. He okay. actually started, he went down as the day went on. And then around like, I want to say like 6 p.m., it just shot up for yep. three or four hours straight. Wow. wow. Well, news outlets across the web are asking how, why, As if we've stepped into some alternate reality, perhaps most poignant are the headlines, how did everyone get it so wrong? In this case, courtesy of Politico. This is important to note as many media outlets were directed by or working with the Democratic National Committee. Thanks to WikiLeaks, we know about this stuff. In effect, these so-called news sources were actively trying to manipulate the public discourse and even assert fact where there was only fiction. Politico has another incredulous headline, quote, how could the polling be so wrong, unquote. The article tries to make sense of the disparity between the polls and election results. In some cases, polls that showed Trump winning were discarded for polls that fit a more preferable political narrative. WikiLeaks has shown more clearly than ever that the U.S. news media is corrupted and more of a cog in the political machine than a government watchdog. Just as the division and anger over the campaign has eroded the idea of America's United, 
The re- revelation, uh, revelations that media outlets collect, colluded with Clinton erodes the value and trust that Americans place in news sources. Let me the, be the first to declare that the mainstream media died with the Clinton dynasty. Good night, sweet prince. Nice. Now on to markets. Because, <laughs> you know, there's, there's also news in markets. They've... Uh, well, and, you know, I actually saw today on Twitter... Um, I, well, besides the fact that it looks as though Hillary Clinton won the popular vote while Trump got the electoral vote, which is a repeat of, you know, the 2000 election, um, how could the polling be so wrong? I guess something came out that showed how a $30 card could hack any one of these, like, voting machines that are being used. Edward Snowden was tweeting about it today. So um, that's that's one way that polling could be so wrong. Let's, all, let's also remember, so wrong, 3%. You know, we're talking about, oh, they were wrong by 3%, and then, you know. It's what it, it, they could just sure, be wrong, sure. right, you know. Definitely, uh, markets responded to election news last night and with shock as the first movers were futures markets with the Dow Jones 30 futures dropping more than 880 points in the first four hours as the world realized Trump was going to win. This all happening around the eight to ten Eastern Standard Time period, and uh, the dollar dropped in value, gold jumped up, uh, the euro saw a boost. All of this happening in the same time as the market panicked. The same futures rallied 1,000 points as of Wednesday afternoon. The S&P 500 futures as well as the NASDAQ futures saw similar movements. U.S. stock markets recovered and are up, but the same can't be said of markets like the Nikkei 225. The the Mexican peso has lost against the dollar, likely based on Trump's anti-immigration rhetoric during the campaign. Trump has also not been shy about calling North American free trade deal a disaster that he wants to end, and he's threatened a 35% tariff on goods imported from Mexico, which is huge, which pretty much shuts Mexico out of the United States market. Yeah, I, there was uh, some, some quotes of his I was reading today, and he was kind of called out on, on that, and he said, you know, hey, it's, it's not a, that's not going to happen, but it's, it's, a, it's a threat, you know, and he's a negotiator. He's, he starts high and... That way, if you call out something ridiculous like a 35% tariff when, you know, they, quote, talk you down to 10%, then you, you look like a nice guy. Right. So, who knows? But well, he, he's, yeah, he seems like a big negotiator. Well, U.S. Treasuries are in the midst of a sell-off with the 30-year U.S. yield, uh, which we reported earlier, rising from 2.53% to over 2.8%. The 10-year bond went from 1.72% to 2% the highest rate it's been since January, which is important to note because there are certain interest rates that are generated from these interest rates here. So, so I mean, shock the world. Donald Trump is president. Cl- Clinton gave her resignation speech today, earlier today. Uh, I was, at, I was at, a, at a diner enjoying, enjoying some breakfast while I watched <laughs> this happen. And, you know, it's, it's, the markets are definitely sort of in this uncertain place. They, I think they've obviously required, uh, recovered, but here's the thing with Donald. He's not a known com- known quantity like Clinton is. Like, Clinton, you can pretty much expect it's Obama 2.0, you know, bigger, blacker, badder, darker. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. Just, just more of that whatever Obama was. And, you know, who knows what Trump's going to do, to be honest with you. He put out this this PDF. Yeah, yeah, this is a it's a, it's a, it's definitely another example of Trump shooting past what he wants because there's a bunch of stuff in here there's no way is going to happen, but he reaffirmed a lot of the stuff. He wants to be out of NAFTA. He had one of the new I don't know how new this is, but he wants to uh, he wants to he affirmed that China was a currency manipulator and wants to continue to go after China for manipulating the currency. Uh, yeah. So definitely some new foreign policy. Well, we'll definitely talk about China later in the episode, but uh Let's talk about more of Clinton, Randy. Well, uh, if you've been you know, paying attention to the news recently, WikiLeaks has been releasing more and more uh, damning emails from Hillary Clinton and her campaign manager, or I suppose former campaign manager, uh, John Podesta. Out of tens of thousands of emails, uh, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange points to one in particular as, quote, the most significant email in the whole collection, uh, which shows Hillary Clinton acknowledging that the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia are directly funding, well, clandestinely funding uh, ISIS or ISIL, uh, quote from Hillary Rodham Clinton, we need to use our diplomatic and more traditional intelligence assets to bring pressure on the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which are providing clandestine financial and logistic support to ISIL and other radical Sunni groups in the region. So the reason this is important is because the U.S. government has denied any claims that the actual governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia were funding the Islamic State. 
instead kind of passing it off as, uh, well, as Julian Assange put it, as some rogue princes using their cut of the oil money to do whatever they like, although the government disapproves. Um, so not only is this showing that uh, these governments are funding these organizations, they're also funding the Clinton Foundation. So um, according to the Clinton Foundation, right. the Saudi Arabian government has donated between 10 and $25 million since the foundation was set up in 1997. So they don't, they don't list exact amounts either. They just have these really broad categories that they list on their webpage. Um, and they also claim that no donations came from Saudi Arabia while Clinton worked as the Secretary of State. However, the government of Qatar did donate $1 million to the foundation in celebration, supposedly, of uh, Bill Clinton's 65th birthday in 2011, which is while Hillary was in office, and the foundation actually failed to report that to the State Department. And now when Clinton came into office, she agreed to allow the State Department to review, quote, new or significant increased support from foreign governments when she took that office in 2009. A recent Reuters investigation found that at least eight other countries besides Qatar, which including uh, Algeria and the UK, gave new or increased funding to the Clinton Foundation during Hillary's tenure without the State Department being informed. Wow. Well, it's it's no surprise. This is more of the same from Hillary Clinton. It's just lies or pay for out, play. Out, outright corruption, deceit. It, it's I mean, it's so the rules aren't for the ruling class. I mean, refreshing in a way to to not have her be president elect. Okay, I mean, whatever you say about Donald Trump, this, this all this this trove of emails proves is that Hillary is definitely the more evil of the two. If you're gonna pick lesser of two evils. Well, geez, I, I, <laughs> it's so I don't hard. even want to say so it. Only hard. time will tell. Yeah. Uh, they've, they, she's already done a plenty of evil, and, oh, and now it, this is what happens when you have a centralized system where you have a ruler. Um, yes. you know, they, they, they tell us we're free, but uh, we're stuck in this system where one of these clowns became the ruler, and their word is going to be treated you know, as something sacred. Well, how about a system where the there, next four years? there is no illusion of freedom? We're, <laughs> we're talking about the great fall of China. We've been reporting on the fall in value of Chinese stock markets and yuan since the beginning of the year. Recently, the ruler of China, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, has been consolidating power and ensuring his continued control of the Communist Party of China. In fact, the party has given him the title of core leader, solidifying his authority. Xi has been shoring up support by replacing existing ministers with party members who are more loyal to his rule. Hong Kong has been a casualty of this power grab. Two recently elected pro-independence activists including, included a defiant anti-China statement during their oath of office for the Hong Kong legislature. China has black, blocked the activists from taking their seats in Hong Kong, causing an uproar and taking off a series of pro-democracy protests. So there was, there's, a, they, there's people coming in that are going to be trying to keep... Hong Kong, or make Hong Kong sovereign as it was supposed to be, according to when they were released from Great British rule back, what was it, 97? Yes, so. the, uh, thanks to some treaties. Yes, and in fact, uh, these these two uh, pro-independence activists, they can get their seats back, but what they have to do is they have to then, uh, and it's similar to their oath, they have to make this declaration that the pro-independence movement is, is not for them, it's bad, and they choose the pro-China you know, stance. So they have to make this declaration. Right, right. And you then, can have your seat. Yeah. Just bow. And that's then they, that's that's where they come up with some subtle way of doing it, but signaling that they uh, don't actually agree. And then that becomes, you know, it's... it's That's the, basically the, what happened with the oath. Right. So then, I mean, that's, that's what happens a lot of times when these kinds of things happen is that the one group demands it and then the other group comes up with a way of, of, of kneeling, but keeping their middle finger up at the same time to send that signal to the people who... Yes. Kiss know. the rings. <laughs> Well, and in fact, one of the one of the oath takers in this sense, all they this person did is say the word China in a different uh, different way, which is slang and sort of like a, yeah, it's sort of like a, a slang against Chinese people, and um, yeah, that's all it really was was a different inflection, I guess, on on a word. Yeah. Uh, well, the recent U.S. presidential election was heavily censored in China, with state-run TV stations directed to focus on U.S. political scandals instead. No shortage of those. Well, yes. <laughs> the Chinese yuan couldn't be shielded by a firewall, and the U.S. dollar exchange rate has fallen to new lows. Factor in rapid deterioration of China's foreign reserves down to $3.12 trillion and add a dash of housing bubble ready to burst, and the future looks dire. Capital controls are nothing new to China, and the latest news is that regulations surrounding insurance have tightened, preventing Chinese from buying some foreign insurance products. 
which has become a stealth loophole to move capital out of mainland China. Hong Kong has seen a surge in insurance sales as a result. President-elect Trump has not been kind to China on the campaign trail, vowing to impose a 45% tariff on Chinese products to protect the U.S. dollar, which, as we talked about with Mexico, would pretty much cut them out of the market. <laughs> It's going to be it's a huge ridiculous. tariff. It's going to be amazing. Ri- yeah. It's a winning I, I, tariff. I, I do the best tariffs. <laughs> and then at, everyone has a job now? Is that what happens? Is that the promise? What happens then? I, you know, I, I don't know if he thought it through. Yeah. I think okay. it just sounded good. When he ro- you know, roll, let me just spitball this for a while. And he just stuck with it. Um, so uh, to protect the U.S. dollar, uh, Asian markets like those worldwide are in an uncertain position given the erratic behavior of Trump. Stock markets initially responded accordingly in the U.S., Japan, Australia, China, and Hong Kong by losing between 2 and 5% of their value. And in many cases, those, those are still the case in Asian markets. So in a, in, a, in a nutshell, China is a tyrannical ruler tightening his grip on a weak economy with a failing currency and a housing bu- bubble ready to pop. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. Well, I think, I think Trump honestly thinks and who knows, maybe he can, but he thinks he can, he can renegotiate a lot of these trade deals and go out and get a better deal for America. If there's something that Trump thinks he can do, he can, he can out negotiate anyone. This is what he thinks at a, at a minimum. And so he th- he's like, I'm going to go and do a, a better job. I'm going to get a better deal. Well, and, and that's backed up in some of these articles that some of these ministers are saying to the effect that he's going to just tear up the deal that's in place. Like they're they're afraid he's just going to be like no I'm just going to pull out you know like yeah, he'll, I think he'll certainly threaten yeah. it he's like you know he'll bluster at a minimum yeah and, oh no he'll bluster that's, yeah. he's really good at that yeah he's got the best bluster and I have I mean I have no idea I mean I think certainly obviously free flow of capital is a good thing but then you get into it and you look at some of these trade deals and it's like well wait but what what's actually in here is it actually a free t- trade deal and so you know I I'm, I'm I don't know about some of these ones. Well, Randy, uh, what's going on with uh, BTCC? BTCC. Wow, I, there's too many E's. Uh, well, BTCC is the oldest, uh, still the oldest Bitcoin exchange that's still running. Um, it's out of China and it's uh, moving into the U.S. market, and it now offers a U.S. dollar to uh, Bitcoin uh, exchange. Um, there's a so yeah, it's a new platform. They're going to have spot and margin trading. The exchange has uh, advanced trading options like market limit stop and one cancel the other, one cancels the other orders. Um, they also have uh, 25 times margin trading. So uh, if you're if someone who's interested in margin trading, you can put up uh, f- you know four percent of what you're looking to invest and borrow the rest from other traders. Um, all but 16 countries and three U.S. states will have access to the Bitcoin exchange. Get this, though. Sign-up requires a photo of a passport, a selfie with your passport, and a third form of identification. Uh, <laughs> this is the first time I've ever seen a selfie listed as a uh, ID requirement, like know your, know your customer law requirement. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're the only one to do that. I think some of the other services require you to wow. share a passport. I, see, I'm not, I don't get into the, uh, the other exchanges and whatnot. But, so, but like uh, the no, selfie no, with a selfie passport? of you holding your passport. At, so at a, really? min, at a minimum, and I don't think, I, I, and as a, I, think, I actually think that to get to the highest level on several of the services, uh, Poloniex, I know for sure I had to do it because, uh, t- as part of, with library for them to uh, approve us. Um, and that's everyone who reaches the level three level on place. So you don't have to do it. Just create an account. It's they, they make it pretty easy to wow. get started. But if you want to reach a certain limit, they want to get, you know, they're, they're trying to be careful. Like that, you know, these laws exist. Yeah. You, and it's, uh, you, you gotta, you gotta follow them just like you gotta follow a lot of the other ones. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hadn't seen that before either, yeah. you know, so it's, it, it's just funny. I mean, selfie, I think, I think selfies are ridiculous, but <laughs> But it, this it, is a crazy. useful selfie. It's, okay. it's 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 crazy, and it's crazy that that's the standard for ID. Like that's the best we can do is we're gonna have a document that we can like photograph right. ourselves. On. Like we can just have such better systems to manage identification. Yeah. yeah. When well, I've I've seen it's either Visa or Mastercard or someone's trying to roll out some kind of like selfie authorization for purchases as well. I, I don't remember who it was, but I remember seeing some headline about that not too long ago. Yeah, because I want MasterCard to be in charge of my identity. Yeah. yeah. yeah I was just thinking that. Oh, yeah. They haven't ever been hacked before. Yeah. Oh, wait. No. Uh, never mind. Uh, Bitmain announces a new massive data center in Xinjiang. I, th- I think that's how you pronounce it. Xinjiang. Uh, Bitmain is known for the Ant miner, miner a cutting-edge Bitcoin ASIC miner, and the Ant Pool, one of the top Bitcoin mining pools. They are expanding their mining operations to include a massive new data center. The first phase of the project will cost 5 billion Chinese yuan, or roughly $800 million, which 
that that number is dropping rapidly. <laughs> the space is a 39,000 square meter space, which is roughly about uh, 420,000 square feet. Wow. And it's offering hosting to about 3,600 racks, and it will be using roughly 135 megawatts of power for these ASICs. Besides the ASICs, Bitmain has all helped design dust, preve- dust prevention systems and cooling systems for the new location. Bitmain's co-CEO, Jiwan Wu, has made it clear that he supports on-chain scaling through bigger blocks, so it is doubtful that the miners will signal support for SegWit, which, which personally I'm fine with. Um, well, and right. interestingly enough, <clears throat> I'd seen a, a list of, sort of some of the most powerful data centers, and uh, this one's rumored to be the third largest in the world. And even that like massive NSA building, I think they call it Honeybee, the one that's in Utah, uh, right by Overstock.com's headquarters. Uh, I think that's like number eight on the list, and this will be number three. So that's going to be all dedicated to Bitcoin wow. in China, which is pretty crazy. I, I, I do. You, did you see anywhere it's if it was China, be solar or any? It's, or it's wind in the power? China Mobile. Um, there's a China Mobile Park. <clears throat> so that's China. It's it's in uh, one of more autonomous regions, and uh, the electricity is subsidized, of course. Um, but it's part of the China Mobile. Um, you know their their cell phone. You know state state run cell phone thing. So, uh, China, well, we're, we're talking about China again, Randy. There's a lot of China stuff this week. Um, and this one's a peculiar story, uh, and it relies on quite a bit of rumors and speculation, which I normally wouldn't bring up, but it's become a popular topic of discussion, and there's, like, weird aspects to it. So I didn't want to skip it. Um, but a recent Zero Hedge article, which I tend to take with a grain of salt anyway, um, but they can often, they usually link to stuff. And if they don't, that's when I really start to question. But and here was a case where they reported that uh, Chinese regulators were allegedly studying ways to limit Bitcoin transactions that take funds out of the country. Um, so similar to what you were talking about with the insurance policies being bought outside in, in Hong Kong, sort of as a hedge against more yuan depreciation. So they're studying the impossible. Right. Well, you know, if, if they're mandating that these things have, if, you know, if they can mandate the transactions have to go through exchanges, like it just, it's not going to stop it, but they can certainly stifle it because there's, you know, threat of penalty or imprisonment or something yeah, like that. Yeah, they can have but, a chilling effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all they'll do is create, it, it doesn't fundamentally solve the problem for them. It's just going to increase the marginal cost of, to get those, to get my, my China only Bitcoin turned into the Bitcoin that I can get out. Right. I'm just, it's just, right. yeah. But I think, and, and here's, and that's, that's great argument there too. Um, one thing I think that's probably missing from a lot of the equations is maybe is it emboldens the user that, that takes that extra step and that goes against that. And when, and when you get someone that is constantly going against the rule of law, especially in China, you know, just imagine how that might affect their other decision-making abilities when it comes to whether they're courageous or not. Yeah. You know. well, are, are you, do you guys have the India cash thing? On Is that on the cycle? India cash? The, so the Indian government has now said that uh, 500 and $1,000 bills. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so the Indian government said 500 and $1,000 bills. Uh, they, they're no longer going to be valid tender in two months. If you have them, you have to you, you can you, you keep your money. You have to go into the bank, say that you have them, because they think that there's a lot of illegally earned money that's being hidden in cash, right? Okay. And uh, this this move is currently getting applauded. People are saying, "Oh, this is so great! This is going to get bring in all this tax money for the government and so on." But the if there's any, if these people owe any meaningful amount of money, all they're going to do is come up with some system to cycle the money. They're just going to pay other people who can. To who can go and get twenties or whatever they need right. to go, who can go right. in and, and cycle them out. Like yeah. they're not going to just go out and declare them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. and so it's the same kind of thing with with China. Like you're not going to it. You you can't solve these problems through making a rule about it unless you're going to be incredibly draconian. Well, and we talked about it on a, a lot of episodes ago. I don't know how many, but we talked about Sesame Credit, which is yes. this uh, re- reputation system, but like state run reputation system that uh, has people you know that you earn points for being a good citizen and you know if you turn in someone for bad behavior you can you know get extra points and they can lose points and it's a very that's draconian well i think two weeks ago we talked about how china was limiting uh uh, transportation access to certain individuals based on their credit score now not even getting into the sesame credit but just their own you know, uh, debts and things like that. So that certain um, citizens in China won't be able to get on a plane because of their credit score. Like, so yes, and then Sesame Credit comes in, and that was definitely one of those uh, spy on your neighbor things because 
you are interlinked with all the people that are around you. And so if someone in your apartment uh, building, for what, for example, is has a negative score, that affects your score. If you see something, say something. And they're bringing your score down, and now you can't get that next perk. Maybe your internet is a little bit slower because your score isn't high enough. For the dramatic version of this, see Black Mirror Season 3, Episode 1. Okay. Available on Netflix. All wow. right. I'll have to check it out. <laughs> I only watched uh, the first episode of the first season, and it was like, I don't know. It was was, it, was weird, that the 5 million... Credit? No, no, this is the, there's a new season on Netflix. Okay. This season. What's the title of the show? Black Mirror. No, I mean the title of that episode. This new ep- I don't. Okay, know. okay. All right. Season uh, three, episode one, though. It's that one. Well, okay. so uh, they, they're going to, they're st- allegedly studying ways to limit Bitcoin transactions that uh, take funds out of the country. So this the Zero Hedge piece cited a Bloomberg article, but didn't provide any link to it, and no such information could be found on the Bloomberg website. Um, so the FinTechniques blog went so far as to write a piece called Zero Hedge Fakes Bitcoin Panic uh, because the market did respond uh, maybe to this, but the, the price definitely dropped because this was quoted on several uh, Bitcoin uh, websites. And again, there was no link to the original Bloomberg article. But this is where it gets interesting. A Reddit user uh, posted an, an alleged screenshot from his Bloomberg news terminal. So something like a, you know, it's like a stock ticker that a professional would use. Uh, allegedly, this article came through the news terminal. Um, but as of now, it still remains unconfirmed. So uh, it's not clear whether or not this actually, they may be studying this or as Jeremy said, if I, it's even going to be effective. I don't think they can, but, I'm very skeptical. They can, they can, unless they're going to just really like essentially try to ban Bitcoin entirely, which is a different story. But I, I think they're going to have a lot of trouble finding this gray area where Bitcoin is like quasi legal and quasi usable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, you know, I'm thinking too, well, how, how can they stop it? How can they throttle it other than throttling the whole internet itself? They either create an entirely fake Bitcoin, like Bitcoin China, where you know you're putting the money in these services, but you don't really own the Bitcoin. The companies hold the Bitcoin, and then there's a bunch of rules about how you transfer them. And in which case, all the people who want Bitcoin simply aren't going to buy that kind of Bitcoin who want it for that purpose. Or you you do it in some way where there's just still loopholes remain. As long as I can transfer the Bitcoin, then I can get it to another address that you know I can get it out. I, I, I'm, my initial reaction is of skepticism. Well, whatever they they do, it'll it'll you know be a system where someone has to use you know they'll have to opt out of using currently available wallets and you know techniques basically. Yeah, or just use another coin. Yeah, exactly. The well, pr- the market will provide. <laughs> they do. Well, we have uh, geez, a, a Tesco bank uh, story here, Randy. Yeah, so Tesco, which I knew as the UK's biggest grocery store chain, apparently also has a banking division. Um, so yeah, Tesco Bank, uh, they have a lot of customers too. They saw a big security breach last weekend. They called it a systematic, sophisticated attack, but wouldn't provide more information than that as there's uh, an ongoing investigation. Uh, initial reports showed that some 40,000 of the bank's 136,000 checking account holders saw suspicious activity over the weekend, uh, and it looked like 20,000 accounts had money taken from them before the bank was able to halt the online transactions. Uh, but newer updates claim that only about 9,000 accounts had been hacked and that uh, Tesco Bank has already refunded all of them. And the, the total was uh, approximately 2.5 million pounds, which is about 3.11 million U.S. dollars. And uh, Tesco Bank also claims that their customers' personal data was not compromised. Well, yeah, I think that's got to be an insider one. They didn't require password resets either. So it's, it's, I think some, their systems got compromised in an internal way. Hmm. Yeah, we just had that story about the, uh, I believe it was India they had, I think it was India that they, were, they had uh, multiple hacking, someone hacked into the ATM system itself, yeah. and then because they had access to that system, they had access to multiple banks' uh, information streams. Or the, I don't remember yeah. the exact story, but they had to reset passwords, reissue cards, but at the very minimum, they had to reset pins on all of them. Reset your pin. An ATM gave me an extra twenty bucks one time. It was awesome. Wow. Yeah, just once. Did you did you do something special with that? I, I don't did know. they find out? Sometimes they find out. Was this years, can, okay? So is this how you're telling us that years ago you bought Bitcoin when it was one cent with twenty dollars <laughs> worth? No, yeah, no, yeah. no. There was there was no ill effect or okay. anything. It, it just it, it, sometimes I'm just it, it, this happens in real life that if you get the if you get an extra twenty, sometimes they will you'll see your it'll they'll adjust the statement they'll they'll figure it out through whatever auditing process they have and uh and adjust the the statement wow mm. I, I bet they can weigh how much money is left and know exactly how many bills are are, are in the stack yeah you know what I, i'm saying like yeah. just passively weigh it mm. uh, i wonder how they do I'm, yeah i'm sure something like that 
Well, there's a data visualization uh, out there that shows 118 coins plotted over time and why holding them uh, might not work. Yeah, that the, that plot that's going around, it's a, that's a semi-log plot. Okay. If you don't, it's, it's powers of 10. Okay. The, if that, that graph were, if it's... A, it, it, if that graph were plotted linearly, it would be w- even more dramatic. I don't know why they made it as a semi-log plot. Uh, maybe just because Bitcoin and would have been off the top, but it, sure, it's even it's it's much much more dramatic. It's powers of ten on one side and and flat on the on the other. So wow. so w- w- talk tell us about Willie Wu. <laughs> yeah, so he uh, cryptocurrency blogger Willie Wu charted 118 altcoins that uh, quote achieved at least an average of two hundred fifty thousand dollar market cap in any one year of their existence. And plotted them against Bitcoin. Uh, the results were less than pretty. Um, we'll have the image available on neocashradio.com and a link, of course, over to uh, Willie's page so you can see that and actually a couple other charts he made. Uh, it, it's really, it's like chart porn. It's kind of fascinating. Um, but the results were less than pretty. The value of many of the altcoins went precipitously downhill. Um, Wu's conclusion is that altcoins are, quote, best left for trading due to their volatility, but very risky as holds. This may change in the years ahead, but for now, out of 700 plus coins in his database, uh, he would say that less than five have a shot of doing something interesting. Um, and he actually posted a cool follow-up chart. Like that one was interesting enough to me. Um, but he posted a follow-up chart the next day that compared Bitcoin against, uh, any altcoins, which had an average market cap of $5 million. And so not just $250,000 now, 5 million in any one year of its existence, uh, of which there were only 18 as opposed to 118. And out of those only six altcoins had outperformed Bitcoin's growth, um, or, or price multiplying with dash being the leader. Yeah, Dash. I I I always, I always like Dash. I like the idea, the technology, the way that they're doing things with the the master nodes. They're getting a lot more involvement than just miners. They're doing proof of stake. I mean, um, yeah, proof of stake for uh, what eight and a half percent or something like that, twelve something percent. Um, so it's like a very diverse mining method, and it's so much layers of redundancy and just the network's capability and stability and security. So I like Dash, but it's just not popular for whatever reason. I just not not grabbing any sort of attention, and so it just lingers where it does. I mean, it's I think it's a functional fine currency, but I'm not advising you to buy or sell it. Yeah, well, for purposes <laughs> of of Bitcoin's purpose in particular, where you're basically seeing it strictly as a currency alternative, that, that is, you're not using a blockchain but as a database for specific purposes like Ethereum. Like, I don't see Ethereum and Bitcoin fundamentally as competitors. Right, like, I agree. Yeah. Uh, and but Bitcoin and and Dash would be right. They're both just trying to be currency. I think there's just so much incentive for it to be like one way. It's a very winner take all. I think kind of kind when of when Darren and I first started the show, there the altcoins were going crazy. It was the, there was a website you could go to and you could put in some uh, preferences and details and select some things and it would generate the the code for you to run your new coin, your coin. And at the point, there were thousands. Thousands and it was just like every day there was new coins and everybody wanted to start their own coin with it, did their own name and whatever, and it, you know it, it, all of them pretty much failed, right? I mean, the the lesson that we were quickly learning was that you should really be skeptical about every single coin because I mean even Bitcoin of course had a lot of promise. This is before the blo- blockchain debate and uh, the block size debate, I should say. And now now that Bitcoin's block size uh, is is stagnant. And, um, and it's just like, I, I don't feel like Bitcoin, unless, unless they, uh, find some on scaling, on chain scaling solution. I don't think Bitcoin's future is going to be as good as, as people had originally thought. Oh, I, you know, I see the whole actual thing is it's, it's classic game theory problem of chicken. You've got parties with two different incentives. You're just talking about the, the miners in China. Of course they want more on chain scaling. Of course, that because that's, what's better for them. Mm-hmm. It squeezes out the the other side of it um but you know there's the the natural outcome of this is that the conclusion will be reached at the last possible minute it's just like a union negotiating with a uh, well as you know an employer and it's always like oh at the last hour everyone comes together it's gonna be the same thing here well we mentioned uh bitcoin unlimited a little bit and and how they have a, a big sort of uh coalition and at one point it measured uh you know f- almost 50% it was 47 something of the hash rate of the hash never, rate never hash rate ne- never well, hash rate when, when we see real bottom line impacts yeah on the the people who have all the, oh. their money in bitcoin it will problem will be solved well it's randy how, you sent a transaction for a few cents to test a I, wallet I address i wanted to test an address and i sent 3 cents and the transaction fee was 20 cents 
yeah through yeah. their bits but it had it's I, we might be coming up on that yeah. point, but we, it hasn't gotten. No, I agree. Enough. And you know what? I like the idea that there is a lot of iteration going on and a lot of different, you know, coins and and things being tried. So, um, and what, going back to my original point, Darren and I basically had this this sort of very simple criteria for evaluating new coins because we were getting inundated with all new coins. What do you do that's valuable? That's different than Bitcoin. Right. What what do you what value can you give me? Is it is it a different name? Is it a different block time or something? That's probably not gonna be valuable. Does your coin do something? Right? And then, you know, Litecoin was obviously different in the way it was mined. There was a lot of a lot of things that made it valuable in the sense of it has new qualities and new characteristics. And then everything was a, just a copy of Litecoin. But um talking about well, with Dash, too, I, there was actually, um, back to FinTechniques, they did a post recently talking about Dash versus negative interest rates in countries where you've got negative interest rates. You know, if you're looking, if you're a millionaire and you've got your money invested in the bank and you're getting negative interest rates, you know, you're, 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 you're paying the bank to store your money for you. And at what point do you then take a look at something like a Dash Masternode, where if you're running a Dash Masternode, you, are, you can actually generate interest. Um, you know, so it's, and certainly Switzerland is on, on top of, uh, crypto on the top of the crypto wave and they seem to be yeah, pretty crypto easy. Valley. Yeah. Crypto Valley. And they seem to be easing off a bit, uh, from regulation thus far, but yeah, so it'll be really interesting to see. Uh, they, he, he pointed to, uh, to Switzerland specifically, but also Japan and Germany and other countries that have negative interest rates. You know, when, will we start seeing something like that? Will we start seeing people with large amounts of money or whatever amount of money start looking at, you know, potential returns as far as regardless of whether or not, um, you know, the, the price fluctuates, but just that there's, that it's generating interest, you know, that may very, that may be an investment worth looking at. Well, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, update on Christopher David and Arcade City. So Christopher David has stepped down as the mayor of Arcade City. After many months of bad press, including a warning we issued on last week's Neocash Radio, Arcade City founder Christopher David has handed over the title of mayor and his council seat to Bernard Lapp, an advisory board member for the Ethereum Foundation. David will move on to another venture called Arcade City Incorporated that he says will be an optional service partner in the Arcade City ecosystem. The Arcade City ARC token sale has broken the five hundred th- uh, the half million dollar mark. Wow. It it's slowed down since the initial burst, but that I think the price, like the amount you can buy per for ether is, is going down, thus the price per ether is going up. Yeah. It's the usual, you know, they're they're pushing uh, you know, they they want a little bit of hype behind their ICO and we're seeing that a lot with a lot of these, you know, alts that are coming out. Uh, and and for those who don't know, um not all. No, not all. Right. We'll, and we'll get to that. Uh, yeah. But, uh, well, and yeah. So for people who maybe didn't tune in last week, we talked a bit about this, but Arcade City uh, is, is a decentralized ride sharing app, or that's what it bills itself as, but it's yet to deliver on that promise. And it's just been a lot of uh, fundraising after fundraising. And uh, so, yeah, there was some problems with uh, Christopher David allegedly mismanaging money and things like that. And uh, in the so, past. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, we, we talked about it a bit last week and, um, so, and and we had uh, before we as we prepared the show there was another ICO that was going on that we're not even going to go into, um, but it was it was like hey we have this new thing we want to make uh, we're going to sell you some tokens and then we're going to make that thing and it, for us we're like no that's a terrible idea you you haven't shown me anything yeah so and go look at that chart on the radio dot com uh, that I was talking about because that paints a pick pretty you know realistic reminder picture of where a lot of these altcoins have gone. Well, we have the benefit of having uh, Jeremy here from library. So, Jeremy, you didn't have an ICO. But you didn't have any sort of sale. I, I would. I just. I'd like to. Start, I reject that uh, pejorative. What's uh, alt altcoin? Okay. Uh, the, uh, I, look, the, a blockchain is a database. That is the right way okay. to think about a blockchain. It's sure. a database plus with a set of uh, rules as to how that database gets updated. Saying uh, an alt an altcoin is like saying uh, my sequel is is I don't know alt oracle or something like that, right? Like there's going to be competition in what people do with blockchains. That's what's wonderful about the technology. Sure, but, I uh, think altcoin I'm more down, specifically I'm stepping down from my uh, well. Okay, my <laughs> uh, one rebuttal. Like one that. rebuttal. <laughs> I think it more specifically refers to I know the the coins that don't do anything. They're just a currency. Like. Ethereum isn't an altcoin because they designed their own framework from the ground up. They didn't. They literally didn't just copy code and and adjust things, right? Um, but but anyway, we, we that's have, a good well, point. And yeah. so you call them library credits? 
Yeah, we call them credits. They're, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry, JJ. I no worries. You right off. No the, worries. I'm just. I did. I was rude right at the beginning. JJ's of the show. not a I'm fragile right, butterfly. Right off the break. Uh, yeah. So you you basically didn't have an ICO. You didn't have a token sale. You actually came out with a product uh, or a proof of concept, and you've been working on that. And um, so that's refreshing because as as we're covering and you know covering all these other ICOs, all these token sales. And there's a lot of controversy around a lot of them, you know, especially in the Ethereum ecosystem. There's all these token sales and now the super DAO, which we didn't get, you know, we won't get to today, but like there's all these token sales going on and there's not much to show for it. So it's refreshing to see someone come out with a product that, and then, you know, not even ask for token sale or not, you know, what's that like? Yeah. Well, th- I mean, it was kind of crazy, honestly. I, we, my attitude with a product has always been, Get, get a product out so that people can start using it as soon as possible. And our what we're trying to do with library and what we we're trying to prove was possible with library was that we can provide a, a user experience that is a, a completely decentralized way to discover, access, and, and purchase digital content. Uh, the way I would describe it to my you know, grandmother is like a community-controlled YouTube. And when we had the barest concept working, and we well, we'd alpha tested it, closed blockchain with like a 1,000 people, but we wanted to get that out because that's how you iterate, that's how you get better get better and um you know we had uh raised money from investors who were backing the company itself privately and i didn't i don't want to i don't want to suggest what what the price should be for library credits i just want to get them out there i just want to get people using them and we thought that was uh you know the fairest way to do it Uh, i also think there are some legal questions surrounding it Uh, but it's also like let let people get them from the miners they don't you know let's not let's not sell them all to to people ourselves right right so that's um Excuse me. Uh, the the thing, you know, library, it's it's one of those things I mentioned earlier where I evaluate it does something, right? The the, the library, I don't look at like I would Most buy a, time. a credit. Okay, <laughs> right. I don't look at like I'm going to go buy a sandwich with some library credits. You know, I'm not going to not going to plunk down, uh, sit down in front of Steam and go get the latest great game with library credits necessarily when, you know, Bitcoin is already working for that and, and then all that. But when it comes to what library does, you know, then it's like, wow, these are very functional and this is part of a, a system. And yeah, yeah but because right, a blockchain is a database. And so, yeah. you know, we, 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 we want to provide this way for people to find and access content from anyone else in a way that the Chinese government can't censor right. when they don't like it. And these, all these countries can't censor it when they don't like it. And the only people that get to decide whether we, you know, watch or access something from someone else is, is the people who are using the thing. Um, and that's both publishers and, and consumers. Uh, and now ostensibly could this, you're saying that libraries are a database and blockchains are a database. Right. So, so that's what's available. We anything, use a blockchain, you right. know, so compared to BitTorrent, right? Right. Now BitTorrent has a lot of problems. Um, in, in terms of both the incentives and, and that there needs to be more legitimate stuff on BitTorrent. But one of the, another big problem with BitTorrent is um, where is it? What's on BitTorrent? I can link to a BitTorrent file, right. but there's not a database that says, oh, this is all, this is what's on BitTorrent. Um, and what library does is it uses a blockchain to maintain a database of this is what's available. This is what's out there. And, and that's what people are publishing and unpublishing to when they create things. Right. Now, are are these you know videos, audio clips, books? Are these going to be available only with library credits, or will there be other? And, and I understand there'll be free content as well if publishers want to list their content as free. But will you accept other currencies, or do they have to be transferred into library credits? Right. So, uh, library does support free content. I definitely want to emphasize that you don't have to use library for money. Uh, but if you are using library for for money, uh, again, that the protocol allows you to do that how you want to do uh, cool. how you want to do it. So right now. Again, we're coming out there with with the bare bones. That so, and it's important to keep distinct that this is a uh, there's the protocol, and then there's the fact that there's a way to use the protocol. We've kind of created the uh, a new HTTP and the new way of using it. So it's like the first web browser and the first protocol for library, the library protocol. Same way that there's BitTorrent the protocol and there's BitTorrent clients. So we've made both of those. Um, our client only deals in library credits right now, but the protocol specification says you can pay each other however you pay each other you know if you guys want to pay with the credit if you guys want to pay with the credit card if you want to pay dollars you want to pay whatever that's fine cool nice well it's you know and and jj was quick to mention as we don't uh you know promote buying or selling any any kind of cryptocurrency but i am i am very interested in the technology and i think it's very neat and you know we're we're working on i've talked to you a little bit about it we're working on coming we're doing some construction here at uh, neocash headquarters to make a video podcast room and we're looking for 
um, you know, a place to, to upload our video that doesn't cost a whole lot of money for high quality video. And also YouTube's run into a lot of problems recently with censorship and things like that and shutting down a lot of channels and, and forced, monet forced monetization of channels once they get to a certain popularity and you're then subject to their advertisements and stuff. So I like that uh, those parts of the equation are taken out here with library and um, we just actually got an account set up and we hope to, uh, start uploading our content here. So if anyone's interested in checking out, uh, some content that's on library, we will, will be up there so you can actually, uh, listen to us via blockchain, which is kind of, kind of meta and neat, I guess. Yeah. Definitely. Block, <laughs> blockchain has a date, right? The block, the, just, uh, I'm sorry. It's the nerd in me. It's a library protocol. We'll, tr we'll stream it to you. Like, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Nice. So, so you're you're saying that uh, basically there's uh, the the client part of searching through the blockchain, like a block explorer, and then there's the blockchain itself. Is that the two pieces you made, or is it just one piece sort of together? Yeah. So you have the piece that's that's kind of standard what you think of with Bitcoin or almost any of these coins, where that's accounts and balances, right? Um, right. Because that's what you that is what's ultimately securing, at least in the a proof of work system, that's what's securing the rest of the data. But I can then write consensus rules to agree on any set of database. And when I say database, I mean, literally think like what you could put in an Excel spreadsheet or any kind of information if you're not familiar with databases. Like, uh, so in the case, then what we do is we use that database to maintain a listing of content that's available. So if you have a copy of the blockchain, you actually have a copy of all of the content that's available on the network. It's the same. They're both in the same. Uh, oh, blockchain. okay. Yeah. Okay. So the blockchain contains all of the uploaded videos. Not, so not all the content, all of the listing, kind oh, of like okay. the catalog, okay. right? So it's actually a very tiny amount of space. And then that listing tells you how to fetch it from a decentralized network in a way that's a lot, very similar to BitTorrent. And so if you run a node on this network, you are then hosting some of this content? That, yeah. Uh, what you, it depends on what kind of node, but that's exactly right. You can do that. So you can take your disk space and your bandwidth, run a library client, and you can actually earn library credits for contributing that to the network. And that's uh, one of the really cool parts about libraries that we allow you to, to basically get paid for that. It's going to waste otherwise. Uh, and then... Two, we are creating this decentralized network off of it right. that uh, that puts all of this content out there. So when you publish, it's going out into the cloud, and then when someone else goes to get it, it's fetched from the other people who are running the software. And as a node, I wouldn't know what's actually on my node or what because it's all pieces and it's all you know that's broken right. up a bit and that's, encrypted or whatever. That's right. So your your computer basically observes these market transactions for hashed content that's enc typically encrypted. It actually doesn't have to be. If you want to publish in the clear, that we encourage that if you want to do that. But if, if you uh, want to publish, for, certainly if it, you want publishing paid content, uh, it, it would be encrypted. And then the, the computers uh, observe these market transactions, observing buys and sells, very tiny amounts, um, and potentially free for this data. And your computer takes your space, it takes your uh, disk space and your bandwidth, and it tries to make as much money as it can off of it. Wow. Contributing it to the network. Nice. Well, or, or you can be charitable. We support you being charitable, that kind of thing as well. So I just got to be clear about that. Well, and so with no ICO, but you got your proof of concept, I mean, uh, you got some funding recently. Is that correct? Yeah. So we, we had a seed round led by some uh, a VC down in Boston, as well as some angels and entrepreneurs uh, around the area. And I'm, I'm actually in the same city as our, our wonderful co-host here, That's here right, in Manchester. That's right. We're in Queen City. Yeah, yeah, the Queen City. Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, uh, that I go down into, into Boston on a regular basis as well, because that's where all the, you know, there's more people who, there's a higher population of people who wear suits down there. Just <laughs> it seems, I don't know, something in the air. It's fancy. Yeah. Very but, fancy. The lobster rolls and such. Well, yeah, it's 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 interesting, and you know, there's been a lot of you know, <laughs> at least in this area, um, you know, they just passed uh, basically legalizing uh, marijuana, not just in in Massachusetts, yeah. but also in Maine and in two other states. And if you talk about the future of money today, well, you can't help but mentioning the use of recreational drugs because. Well, humans love to do that, regardless of what you look like or what you sound like. So we actually have a. Recent interview with Matt Simon, the New England uh, political director and legal analyst for the Marijuana Policy Project, who was instrumental in getting uh, some of those bills passed. We had him on for a special interview recently. We called The Painful Economics of the War on Drugs, which you can find at neocashradio.com. That's neocashradio.com. Great so for Bitcoin, though. So they, they can't bank, right? The marijuana companies, they can't get right. bank accounts. Right. So, yeah. And in most cases, and, and that's the thing is that it's it's... I mean, there is an area by area thing. Like it's initially in Denver or in Colorado, it was okay. Then banks started shutting down, and then you know the bigger banks, of course, 
they start they were the first ones to be like, well, you know, we're a multinational company. We can't deal with any of this. But uh, do uh, where where can people find out more about library? Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Jay. You're better at this than I am. Uh, we, the you can go to our website lbry.io. Uh, we're also on pretty much every other place, um, on Twitter at LBRYIO, on Facebook at LBRYIO, uh, on Reddit at our library, our LBRY. Uh, on the website, um, you can, uh, if you're a publisher, we would especially love to hear from you. Um, we're looking for publishers, and publishers get some uh, special rewards if they come in early. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can learn more at our website, LBRY.io. Excellent. And just a reminder that you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. And if you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews like the one I just mentioned with Matt Simon, uh, you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, YouTube, and so much more. Well, thanks you all. thank you all for listening. This is uh, episode 181 of Neocache Radio. Thank you, Jeremy, for being on the show. Thank you. And thanks, Randy. Thank you, JJ. Excellent. Hopefully, Darren will be back soon. This is Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. Neocashradio.com. Oh.